Welcome to this Battle of Ideas session. My name is Tim Black. Uh, I'm a writer for the online magazine Spiked, uh, and I'm chairing this session. So, to help us explore some of these questions, we have two great speakers. We have Andrew Keane to my right. Uh, he's, the, uh, he's an entrepreneur and uh, founder of audiocafe.com. Uh, he's the author most recently of Digital Vertigo, how today's online social revolution is dividing, diminishing, and disorienting us. Uh, and to my left, uh, we have Dr. Norman Lewis, uh, consultant on innovation at PwC, uh, and co-author of Big Potatoes, the London Manifesto uh, for Innovation. There appears to be quite a lot of actual live tweeting going on, I can hear, which is fantastic. Good to see nature's getting to the spirit of this session. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Norman. Whenever I have discussions with people about social media, I'm kind of drawn to Monty Python's The Life of Brian. Do you remember that scene where everybody says, well, what did the Romans ever do for us? And people say to me, well, what has social media ever done for us, apart from destroy our privacy, destroy our aut autonomy, etc.? And then you say, well, they've made picture sharing a lot easier. Okay. They've connected a billion people, not bad. They have created real-time search, which is what I regard Twitter as being. I don't know about you, but for example, two years ago when the snow was coming down around Gatwick, do you remember when everything, all the airports were shut? Um, if you followed Twitter on what was happening, you knew what was going on at Gatwick more than any of the updates that you got on any of the official media, because you had people who were tweeting in real time about what their experience was of get, getting on a train getting to Gatwick, what was actually happening on the ground before the official media informed you as to whether you should go to the airport or not. Very important. So you say a question, okay, well besides all of that, what else has social media ever done for us? And the problem with this discussion I always find is that we seem to be, particularly those people who are raising enormous concerns about what's happened as a consequence of the emergence of social media, particularly around privacy, the fact that uh, people are now sharing the innermost thoughts, that they are sharing their locations, they are being able to, they are being tracked wherever they go, etc. Um, is that yes, there is a problem there, but we constantly start as a consequence of that focus, we start having the wrong discussion, I feel, about social media and about its importance or its relative importance um, uh, in, in our society today. The thing that really strikes me in a lot of this discussion is this notion that somehow because we now live in a world where we have social media, that the social media itself now determines and is dictating our behavior, that we now are being compelled to do these kinds of things as if this technology has now is looming so large upon us that we have no choice but to be part of these networks. So if you're not on LinkedIn, you don't have a career prospect for the future. If you're not on Twitter, if you don't have so many followers, you're not going to be taken seriously. When people are looking at you, for example, for employment, they'll be looking at, do you have a Facebook profile? Do, are you on LinkedIn, etc. Now, employers are doing things like this. But the idea somehow that this now becomes something that becomes um, absolutely necessary for us to exist in 21st century society, I think is a fetishized discussion. I think it's completely wrong. Social media, like any other technology, is merely technology. It does influence behavior, I'm not arguing that it's not, but it is not determining our behavior. The things that we see that are worrying in social media, for example, the fact that people have lost or appear to have lost this distinction between what is public and what is private, that is a reflection of a much broader cultural or contemporary uh, malaise than simply the fact that social media has ex exists or that that's the cause of the problem. I think we're inverting reality. If we really want to understand why that erosion has happened, we've got to look beyond social media. It's not social media that will explain anything to us other than the fact that it's a phenomenon that is allowing these behaviors to be expressed in the first place. And that is really my biggest concern about this debate. And I think you, you come across any of the evangelists of social media, they, it's, it's, it's a discussion that I would call one that is firmly rooted in the present 
It's this kind of overwhelming presentism. There's no explanation of how we got here or why and how these things have changed and what significance the ch the, the, this change represents. So for example, if you take this whole notion of the need to update your status and all of that, it's very interesting that if you look at companies like Facebook and you look at Twitter and all of that, these, these, these young entrepreneurs who have made billions out of developing technologies and companies around this, they themselves don't even understand the social forces that have created the momentum for such a thing. Everybody thinks it's about the fact that, that, that Zuckerberg, for example, you know, couldn't get laid in Harvard, and then he went off and he created this website because he, you know, he knew how to code websites, and he created this, this thing called what eventually became Facebook. The real point about Facebook is that Facebook is an expression of something that was happening for a long time before that, which has fundamentally altered the way society has been operating. And what I would be more interested in discussing around Facebook is what's happened to kids, how children's lives have changed, what we call digital kids, kids who have grown up with this technology at their fingertips. What is really more important to understand Facebook is not the technology, but to understand how childhood has changed, how childhood over the last 15, 20, 25 years has been refashioned through risk culture, which means in, in, in shorthand, that kids are growing up today more in the presence of adults because they are, they are influenced by this culture, this risk culture. That, you know, today kids cannot be on their own with their peers without adult supervision in almost every sphere, if you think about it, from school, after school, at home, or whatever, you're, they are constantly in the presence of adults. And so why, what really happened was the, the, the kids themselves whose social need to mix with their peers away from their parents, outside of the adult gaze, created the momentum for tools and solutions that could help them overcome that problem. That's why they turned to the virtual world. That's why the virtual world became so important to them, because in that space, they could create autonomy for themselves. They could create a space within which they could experiment with their uh, identities. They could begin to, to do the things that perhaps many of the more gray-haired people in this room were able to do when they were growing up, which was to find that space and do the kinds of things that you have to do as a kid as you're growing up and moving towards adulthood. And so the virtual world, that's where the impetus for Facebook, MySpace began before Facebook. MySpace was my space, not your space, daddy's space, or anybody else's space. It was a space that I could do what I wanted to do. In other words, it was about self-absorption. It was about self-expression. It's about the space where I could express what I really thought. And for me, the most important thing in this was not so much the content um, of, I've got 30 seconds, of, of what was being said. It was the fact that other people acknowledged that you existed. And so that impetus, that's really where the impetus for Facebook came from. The need for friends, the fact that acknowledgement, self-expression, etc. I think the more worrying point to raise about, and I've got a lot more to say, but in the short period that I've got left, the more worrying concern that I have about this is that what we saw as something that was peculiar to digital kids, to young people, has now become something that all adults are doing as well. It's the kind of infant, infantilization of society that's really happened, which for me is more worrying uh, about what the Facebooks of this represent, uh, what Facebook represents in the world today. It's that thing that I think we should be concentrating. But most importantly, and I'll just leave you with this one thought, I think the problem is as well that because we have become so absorbed by a discussion about self-absorption, we are kind of lo losing the fact that what underpins a lot of this these new social platforms are indeed platforms that I think have got enormous productive capacity and potential for the future. We're not talking about that. What we're concentrating on is the fact that it's, it appears to now today to be more important to update your status than, for example, to update your knowledge of how the world works. Well, Norman says we've got to see the bigger picture, and I, I do see the bigger picture because I wrote my book, Digital Vertigo, around Alfred Hitchcock's movie, Vertigo, which is a very big picture. And Norman said, we don't want to fetishize discussion. Well, of course, with my interest in Hitchcock, I'm fascinated. I, I love to fetish, I fetishize fetishisms. 
Um, so I, I like fetishistic discussion. I think any discussion without fetish is boring. And actually, of course, what Norman did, having said we shouldn't fetishize discussion, he fetishized childhood. He fetishized the innocence of the child, somehow saying, well, uh, so we, we need social media because these children have been smothered by their kids and it gives them space. I don't know if you, I have kids, I don't smother them. I'm, in fact, I'm away about 90% of the time. So the idea that children need social media, I think, is a mistake. I think it's a, a big mistake to generationalize social media, I think. Either way, on, in either party, you, you fall into the trap of either turning it into a, a utopia or a dystopia. So, good or bad, let me say a couple of bad things and a good thing. First of all, I think the important thing to note about social media is it's increasingly becoming all media. I think it's wrong, you know, everyone talks about social media, oh, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. But actually, all, and I'm from Silicon Valley, all media is becoming social. So Netflix, for example, is adding a, a social uh, element. The big movie studios now are adding social functionality to their product. And what that means then in terms of social media is that the media of the 20th century, a classic example would be Hitchcock, he made a movie and we all went to see it and then afterwards we chatted about it, but we went into a dark room to watch it and then we came out into the light. Um, media is fundamentally changing. Uh, it's all becoming social in the sense that we're all on this network. Two billion of us are currently on it. By 2020, 2025, maybe everyone in the world will be on it. And it's a media in which we are broadcasting ourselves and, in, and particularly broadcasting our habits, our data. Data is the new oil. This is what Reid Hoffman calls Web 3.0. Uh, the ubiquity of personal data. And the, this platform is one in which we are um, broadcasting everything about ourselves, our desires, our wishes, our histories. Look at each other now. Look at your, you, some of you are sitting next to strangers. Look at each other. Go on. It's Britain. You can even do that. You can be a fetishist for a moment. Um, you don't really know much about each other, do you? Most of you may be sitting next to boy, even if you're sitting next to your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husbands or wives, you probably don't know much about each other. But in 10 years, that's going to be different because you have services now like Highlight, which, which are on Highlight, which is like kind of Foursquare plus Facebook plus Twitter. If you're on these services, you will know everything about ourselves. You will know what movies they watch, what music they listen to, where they went to school, what their networks are, what their desires are, what their sexuality is, what their religion is and isn't, where they want to be, where they've been, where they will go, what they are doing, what they travel on. So what we're doing is creating a network, a what, you know, rich data network in which everything will be revealed, a radically transparent one, in which we're living more and more publicly, indeed we're destroying privacy. So that's the first bad thing, I think, about social media. And I use this term in using Norman's phrase in the bigger picture, meaning all media. We're destroying privacy. We're living publicly. We're living under the spotlight. In my book, I call it hypervisibility. And the destruction of privacy, in my view, is a bad thing. It destroys our species. You remember the moments in Vertigo, those of you who have seen it, where corpses fly off of phallic towers. Well, that's what we're doing to ourselves. We're destroying the darkness inside us. What defines us as human beings is what we don't say rather than what we do say. And in a culture of social media, we're saying more and more. So the destruction of privacy, in my view, is a bad development. Um, it's something that we should be deeply concerned about because we need to protect the interior space, the darkness of the self. Second bad thing about social media is that uh, it is encouraging what I call digital narcissism. Narcissism, of course, is always exists. Norman's right to argue that not everything stems from social media. There was narcissism. The Greeks invented the term. Christopher Lash wrote about it before the invention of the internet. But narcissism is the great seduction of the internet. As we can increasingly broadcast our own data, we think we're interesting. Most of us aren't. In fact, none of us really are. So we're creating a culture of narcissism in which we're watching ourselves, listening to ourselves, and it's creating, I think, an antisocial culture, an antisocial environment, where it's harder and harder to actually listen up to others, particularly people who are different. The other reason why social media is a problem, is bad, is because it's, um, uh, to quote Michel Foucault, it's a trap. 
I use the metaphor of Hitchcock's vertigo in my book because like Jimmy Stewart, for those of you who have seen the movie and, and Hitchcock's narratives are always the same, it's always about an innocent being in swept into a narrative they don't understand, a dark narrative in which they're exploited. And that's what's happening to us in social media. We're all lured to these free networks like Facebook and all these other networks, the thousands of networks, Foursquare and everything else, but they're all living off our data. They're all exploiting us. There's the old cliche when you're sitting around a poker table and you don't know who the full person is, it's you. And it's all of us in social media. We're all being exploited. We're having our data mined, our data sold. So we've become the product. And that's a bad thing. It's also a bad thing in political terms. We can talk, of course, about the Arab Spring, which clearly is a complex narrative. But in political terms, governments are learning more and more about us. Governments both in authoritarian, repressive regimes and in the supposed dem democratic West in the US and the UK, they're learning more and more about us. Julian Assange said famously that the Facebook could have been a CIA plot, a CIA creation. The problem, of course, is that the CIA isn't smart enough to create Facebook. Finally, let me just say one good thing about social media. I think it does offer an opportunity for self-fashioning. I just read a book on the Renaissance by Stephen Greenblatt, and I think Norman's right to talk about social media representing uh, a new moment, a new stage in socioeconomic and cultural life. It offers an opportunity to us to self-fashion ourselves. And perhaps we can learn from the Renaissance or from earlier periods in history, even the industrial period, where we begin to self-fashion ourselves in a more coherent and responsible way. Thank you. Norman, uh, I believe Andrew called you a disavowing fetishist. Uh, I just wondered if you'd like to respond. I wouldn't want to share my fetishes, fetishes in, in public. Um, Why? <laughs> well, for the very reason that I believe that the Private, sect, private sphere is very important to personality and I, in fact I've got no disagreement with Andrew on the points that he's making about um, the, the dangers this represents to, to privacy. Um, but I, I, I really think you have to question some of what he's arguing because the identities that we present on social media, are they our real identities? I'm not so sure they are. I think they're very manufactured, precisely because we are aware. Um, well, let me ask a question before I do that. How many people in this audience have ever blogged? Who own their own blog and who stick it out there? And do you recall the first time you blogged? The first time that you were gonna press that return button, which meant that you were publishing yourself to the world. Did you hesitate? Did you have any thoughts of concern about what you were actually doing? Anybody agree with me? And now you're kind of hardened cynics. You're kind of hardened. You don't think about that anymore because now this is your personality. And what you're really thinking about is not do I really feel this, but will other people find this interesting? Will this be acceptable? Now, you might argue that that's a valid uh, perspective because of, obviously you're in trying to engage in some kind of conversation and you want to try and meet your audience halfway. But I believe that what's happening is people are manufacturing their identities in order to subscribe to some kind of view of themselves that they think the world wants to see or that they want the world to see. And whether that's the real identity that we have, I don't believe it is. You see, I still argue that even in the presence of being in this public space through this social media, we still have our private selves, where there's that, always that little moment of checking that goes on in your head as to what exactly you are putting out there. And therefore, this kind of inexorable um, road that Andrew seems to be spelling out to us, I don't think really exists. Yes. Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and all these other platforms are collecting our data. But what's interesting, you see, I, I, th I think we've got to start, start behaving like adults in this discussion. In Not some true. cases, we are quite happy to give up our privacy because we expect something in return. We expect, for example, that one of these platforms is going to actually deliver something to you that you want, namely, for example, that 
when you are close to a particular location, you might get alerted to the fact that there is something important happening that might be of interest to you. I don't want to be intruded upon by Facebook or Google or anybody else pushing adverts at me because I've read a book about fly fishing once on Amazon. The point I'm trying to make is that we are prepared to give up some of our data because we think we're going to get something in return. What really concerns me about the data collection that goes on, say if Facebook and everybody else wants to use this data to try and develop services and products or whatever that is going to help me more, be more productive, more entertained in my life, I really don't have a problem with that. Where Andrew makes the point, and he just kind of elides the two together, is that what concerns me is that that data now being in the kind of becoming more of a kind of public commodity is what the state does with that. And that's what we really have to be concerned about because I think the cultural destruction of the separation of the private and the public has got enormous political con consequences for us in the future. And I think that's something we should really be debating um, because that's the only, sol the only way we can counter that is by making people aware of that fact and ensuring that those boundaries are, 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 are maintained in one way or another. Thank you, Norman. Andrew, would you like to come back? Yeah, let me just say a couple of things. Firstly, I agree with Norman. Manufactured identity is key. I mean, that's another way of talking about self-fashioning. And I think that's, again, without wishing to fetishize children, um, I think that's one area where young people are actually understanding this medium a lot more than older people. What one needs to do on social media is be dishonest, is be creative, is, is reinvent one's identity. Zuckerberg famously said, in his self-interested, childish way, you've only got one identity. And he, of course, wanted to earn that identity. He created a product called uh, Timeline, to, to, to actually literally physically uh, own it. But what this new media does is offer the opportunity to really manufacture interesting identities in the 21st century. And I think that's necessary as our brand shift, as our individual identities shift to this platform. When Norman said at the beginning, we're not compelled to be on the network, we are, I think he's wrong. Um, what we're seeing is this shift from an industrial hierarchical 20th century to a more digitalized, knowledge-centric 21st century. And this is the platform in which we live. This is how we define ourselves. This is how we get jobs. This is how we build our brands. Fewer and fewer of us are working for large corporations. The biggest challenge is today's economy is to invent and reinvent oneself. Whatever you come out of college studying and being an expert in, you will change over time. On these are the platforms on LinkedIn and Facebook in which one can indeed manufacture identities. Not only sexual, personal, intellectual identities, but professional ones. So I think that these platforms are ones in which we're compelled to be on, which is why this is such a critical discussion. It's not a technology discussion, it's not a media discussion, it's a political discussion. Very quickly, three other areas where I think we can work towards civilizing the, the network. The first is I think we need to teach the internet how to forget, or teach the network how to forget. At the moment, uh, we've created this inhuman network which is incapable of forgetting. There's new technologies now which enable, for example, the degeneration of data. I think if in, in, the, in the movie The Social Network, the fictional Sean Parker says famously, first we lived in villages, then we lived in cities, then we live on the internet. We do live on the internet, but if we're going to live on it, it's got to be human. It needs to learn how to forget. We do need government. I am very sympathetic to what the EU is doing in terms of institutionalizing laws about forgetting. And we need new businesses. I think we need privacy, new uh, privacy-centric businesses. We need a response to the free model of companies like Facebook and Twitter. The more we can charge people to protect their data, I think the more comfortable people will be with the network. I think that privacy will become one of the most valuable commodities of the 21st century. And for any of you in the audience who are entrepreneurs, don't build your new businesses around openness or radical transparency. Those are old-fashioned, archaic ideals. The new hot thing, the new sexy thing is privacy. The new sexy thing is darkness, mystery, secrecy. That's where you can make your fortune. Hello. Um, I also have concerns about privacy, but I think as human beings, we've always been narcissistic. We always 
have wanted to leave our mark. Um, as a teacher, I do have concerns about youngsters who don't know how to protect their privacy or how to behave on the internet. So I was just interested to, think, to, to hear about what you feel. Um, my question is, has the pace of technology gone so fast that actually etiquette and manners that go with it have developed alongside? Hi. This has echoes of a discussion at a previous Battle of Ideas where Cory Doctorow made some points about privacy. And my position is developing, but I think it's really important to advocate ownership of the data about you and to be able to, looking forward, to safeguard privacy and to enter the positive aspects of social networking with an openness is to be able to, uh, in your words, um, enforce some forgetfulness. If we want to delete the data about us, we should be able to. Hello, hi, I'm Ali. I guess, a quick question about that point about forgetting. And I wonder if actually there are benefits in not forgetting. Um, thinking about you know, the old saying of, those who forget history are doomed to repeat it. Are there actually benefits of having our history go with us? Um, and then the second point is that point about transparency and how much information we give out. I, I would, I think, echo Norman on that. You know, we give out information every day quite willingly. You know, you go into Tesco's, you give out information about yourself. When you complete a survey for a customer research survey, you give out information about yourself. Why should this information be any different? There's a wonderful new book by James Gleick. It's called The Information. Again, a wonderful history of technology. And in it, he comes to the conclusion that we are data. Just as, you know, in the 18th century, philosophers like Hobbes discovered that we were physical bodies, so now the great philosophers are discovering that we're data, we're DNA, we're the data we distribute on the network. And I think that in a peculiar historical way that's true. And what it means is that power in this world is defined by who owns the data. So it's no coincidence that Zuckerberg is worth, you know, 10, 15 billion dollars, that uh, Reid Hoffman is a multi-billionaire. These are the new data barons. These are new powers. The wealth in the 20th century is owned by the people who dug the oil out of the ground. In the 21st century, data is literally the new oil. And the ownership then of data becomes a major political issue. But we can't, as consumers, as innocents, as Jimmy Stewart's in this narrative, we can't have it every way. We can't not pay to use Facebook and then think we own the data from this free network. We need to become more data illiterate. We need to empower ourselves to read the terms and conditions of these services, we need to simplify them. So we, as users of data, need to seize back the data from these companies. And there are lots of idealists who believe in public data companies, public data banks. Maybe one day that will be a reality. Some people are talking about the phone being the network. This is the new kind of political economic battleground, I think, for power in the 21st century. Who owns the data? Companies, governments, organizations, healthcare providers, individuals. And then I agree on the issue of forgetting. I think one of the interesting things about this issue of forgetting, though, is as we become more and more public figures, increasingly some people say, I've had this debate with the people on the other side, and they say, well, forgetting is totalitarian because in the future, historians may want to study us. The lady at the back said, history repeats itself. As we become public figures, we, in a peculiar way, are creating ourselves as public figures. We may not be JFK or Martin Luther King or Margaret Thatcher, but we have to understand that perhaps that's the downside, the dark side of all this publicness is that as public figures, as celebrities, everyone is a celebrity in the 21st century. Everyone is Margaret Thatcher or Martin Luther King. Our legacies become harder and harder to escape, and we have fewer and fewer rights for future generations to forget us. So that the darkness that I'd like to explore and, and enable, that the new dark room, which I think we need to build in the 21st century to enable forgetting, and maintain who we are as human beings may be compromised by the very publicness of our identities in the 21st century. 
Well, to, to continue some of those points, but at the danger of being called a fetishist again about children, to, to go to your point about the school kids and all of that. You see, I, again, I think that somehow, sometimes we miss the, 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 the real point here. The kids are better at this technology because they have learned that they need to use this technology in a way that they have to circumvent the boundaries that have been set by society, by their parents, by, by the technology itself. And as a consequence, they have become a lot more adept at using this technology. The fact that they can no longer make a distinction between public and private, that they will express on their blogs or on Facebook or on whatever social network they might be on, uh, things that they should not be talking about, uh, that they should not be revealing about themselves. I don't blame them. I think there is a problem that they do that, but the reason they're doing it is not because the technology is there, because adults are doing it. Because today, the public sphere has become a caricature. Uh, the private sphere is now, everything's out in the open. You know, politicians today, we're not interested in what they have to say about their ide ideas or their ideologies. We want to know what they're not telling us. What they're not telling us about their expenses. What they're not telling us about the hidden, this kind of conspiracy theories where the authority of knowledge has become such that we now question not what we see, but what we think's behind it. It's what's not being said. And so this point about forgetting, and, and all of, I think it's a very problematic discussion. Um, and it's a much broader discussion than we can possibly go into here. This brings me on to this point about data. You see, again, I think Andrew goes too far because there are pieces of data that if they are joined together could have immense uh, impact upon um, our lives. For example, in the sphere of medicine, in the sphere of medical research, the fact that if we are able to amass great amounts of data about diseases, about the, how they spread, about health applications or whatever, this, this could be a rich source of innovation for the future. What I'm concerned about is that in our concern about the data and big data for the future, we are gonna throw the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, I don't believe there's a black or white answer here. You're either for or against. I think we have to have a public debate and a political debate about where we draw the limits. But to simply make a bold statement or a broad statement that says that you know, who controls that data, that we have to become the personal owners of that data, et cetera, um, whilst it sounds very appealing in the first instance, I think we need to just step back a minute and think more about, because this is the problem. We are constantly having this discussion, ladies and gentlemen, in the sphere of self-absorbed consumption. We are not talking about these technologies as the productive potential they have for the future in terms of how they could transform our, our lives, how they could help us to, 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 to produce better products and services for the future, health outcomes or whatever. The problem is we are fixated on consumption and what we're doing in the sphere of consumption, and that's just half the story. We really need to return this debate, I believe, to a much more objective discussion about what the productive potential is in connecting two, three billion people together, which I think is enormously, has enormous potential for the future. I helped start a recruitment company three years ago, and without social media, it would have failed. I have data on thousands and thousands of people on our servers. What that data has been, you know, very helpful. Part of me wants to keep that data, but what do the panel think I should do with it? What would be the best practice? You said we're all data, and um, I quite like this idea, what we can do with that data. In Iceland, they've taken a DNA profile of everybody in the country, and we know that if you're arrested, even if you're not then charged with something, police will keep your DNA record for now, I think it's now limited to seven years, isn't it? Do you think that we should all have our DNA profile taken or will that move us into a sort of post uh, Stasi land, you know, the kind of East European um, dystopia? 
I'm, I'm interested that you've raised the political dimension about this, and clearly it is something that we've got to talk about as a society. But in my experience so far, and I'm a big user of social media, I've been a blogger for seven years, I use Twitter and all the rest of it. The only thing that the private sector has done with my data is it stopped boring me with adverts about things that I'm not interested in. So I'm actually quite happy with the outcomes by and large. And I remember I was in Poland when advertising began on TV after communism had fallen. And the first advert was for some obscure agricultural product that everybody in Poland was being made to watch the advert for when there were probably about 5,000 people who might buy it. So what social media has done for me so far is it's improved my relations with the private sector. And I have to say I'm not afraid of them. My greatest enemy is the British state. I don't know anyone who's a bigger threat to my liberty or to my wealth um, than the British state. And they're taking data on me, as this lady has said, from birth. So if you're offering me a political solution to this, I have to say I'm actually quite scared of that because anything that the politicians do to regulate this, I guarantee will make matters worse. So my question is, can, can the industry do anything to help us to make sure that we retain ownership and control of the data that we choose to publish to our friends and allow them to take some benefit from by focusing advertising and so forth? I know my generation tend to um, make up their own identities in media, as mentioned before, but it's, as, it's for a social desirability effect. Um, I do believe that we have a slight private standing in this life, but it's these new personas that are being shown publicly that are affecting our futures. For instance, universities look at Facebook pages and so do workforces. Um, and so my question to you is, are we so influenced by media that we all have slowly began to infantilize our self-expressions and began targeting other people, such as trolling on YouTube and Facebook, um, and then encouraging antisocial behaviors in real life? I guess, you know, we're physical beings, we live in a physical world. What is the implication of social media on social interactions in the physical world? I mean, is social really social? I suppose the, the, the way I would come back on, on quite a few of the points that have been made in the discussion, whether it's about social media or about data, is that in, in all of these spheres, these can be used for good and for bad. It just depends on the, the social context within which this happens. So, you know, I do believe that, for example, around data, around DNA profiling or whatever, that if we were able to capture all of that across society, that that would yield enormous insights. Data could be used against us. For example, it could be used around things like insurance or indeed, you know, revealing things about you that, for example, you wouldn't want your employer to know because they might not employ you because you're actually what it's revealing is that you've only got about another three and a half minutes to live and you know they're going to waste their investment in you there are already things like that happening so for example you've already got services that are tracking what you do in your car uh, which with the promise being that you will get cheaper insurance because if you don't speed if you don't brake often if you etc etc this will already tell you um, will we'll offer you a cheaper premium in your insurance because you're a safer driver. But the fact that you've got somebody sitting in your car observing everything you're doing in your car, um, is that something we're comfortable with? Now, the point about the political dimension of this is that it, it's precisely where, where this becomes a problematic discussion is when that big data becomes part of, for example, the state apparatus of how this could be used to monitor citizens and what it might be able to do in terms of limiting um, individual freedoms or autonomy or whatever. When we say it's a political debate or political discussion, from my point of view it's about it's how the public perceives this and what the public is prepared to accept or not. And the fact that we're having this discussion today is a very important one because it's the kind of public discussion that we meet, need to have to make people more aware of what the implications of all of this is so that choices can be made and trade-offs can be made uh, where we feel that's appropriate. So 
I, you know, I do believe that that is, we have to have a conscious discussion about what this is all about, not one that is where somebody throws up an example of how your data has been used for this. And we kind of scaremonger each other into panicking in a way that we seek to try and resolve this through legislation or through institutionalizing stuff. And I don't think that this is subject um, can, be, can be dealt with at that kind of knee-jerk reaction to the kind of challenges that face us. It really has to be a considered discussion. And I think this, this is very much a part of, of, what we, of what we have to engage in. My final point is to really return to what I see as the kind of upside of this, of, of what I call the, 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 the produ productive potential of where this is going. You know, I'm very sensitive to the kind of dangers and the concerns that Andrew's raising, because I think he's raising some very important points. But I think the problem with that approach totally is that we have the wrong focus in this discussion. We are being forced into a discussion where we are having to react to what we see as the risks of the bad side, the kind of negative implications of all of this, where we're not really talking about the positive implications. And what bothers me about this is two things, and I'll leave you with this. On the one hand, it assumes that just because we now, these are the platforms that we have to participate in in the future, and Andrew's right, we do have to participate. You can't escape it. But the fact that we do that doesn't mean that we then just become these automatons that just you know, passively, slavishly f fall down in the face of what this technology demands of us, and we just, you know, in like a dreamlike state, just enter into this uh, without being naive about what possibly could be the outcomes. I think this, is, this underpinning, underpins a, a kind of very diminished view of what people are and how they are influenced by, 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 by social media. And that, that's very concerning. The second point is, I think it also reduces what our expectations of this technology should be for the future. Because if this technology is inexorably going to be one where it's data, 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 and you're going to have no control and blah, 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 then what we're really saying is stop. We don't want any more of this. We don't want social technologies. We don't want this to be developed. We don't want these platforms. And I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that you can really see the positive impacts of these kinds of technologies, for example, inside the enterprise, where for the first time you've got the possibility of platforms that are allowing people to collaborate in ways that you could never have done in the past, or if you tried to do in the past, it would have cost you millions and millions of dollars to do, where people are becoming more efficient, more productive, more enjoying their work more as a consequence of this, I see there's a really positive upside on all of this. We're not talking about that, we're talking about the dangers. And I just say that if there's one thing I would like you to take away from this discussion is to stop being self-absorbed about consumption and self-expression in the consumption field. Think about the productive side of this. What could we do with this kind of capability where we can connect these people, a billion people, where we can connect all employees in an enterprise where they can have a conversation that they've never been able to have in the past. What can come out of that? I can tell you from my own experience and what, what I'm particularly doing, amazing things can come out of that. And it's just the beginning of this journey. So let's not get too drawn down this kind of doom, gloom, fear for your life, don't indulge or whatever, because I think that's going to narrow the discussion down, where in fact what we need to do is broaden it. I think Norman said something really interesting. He said that the public sphere has been privatized, and I think he's right, the way in which politicians, sports stars, celebrities of all kinds, you know, news is made about their private rather than their public life. But there's another side to this. Uh, if those of you interested in the, the history of the public sphere might read you know, people like Hannah Arendt, the private sphere has been publicized. It's a very profound observation, the way in which the privatization of the public sphere goes together with the way in which the historic private sphere now has become more public. You have to think about both simultaneously. You can't separate them. So I think that's a very profound point from Norman. Let me be more critical of him in a couple of other areas. He speaks about the value of social media and publicness and collaboration in the enterprise. I think he's very wrong there. There's a huge boom in social applications in the enterprise. Yammer, for example, just sold for a billion dollars to Microsoft. 
He says it makes us more efficient, more productive, more innovative, more creative. I think he's wrong. I think real innovation requires being alone. Go and read John Stuart Mill's On Liberty, or more importantly, read Susan Cain's new book called Quiet, in which she talks about Steve Wozniak, who invented the personal computer when he worked the night shift, when he was alone. I think that we have fetishized, we've created an ideology of out of collaboration, which I think is mistaken. I think we have to be very careful to think that innovation comes from collaboration. Innovation comes from being alone. Innovation comes from telling other people to piss off and lock yourself like Steve Wozniak in a dark room to create remarkable things. Finally, I think Norman's fighting an old battle. He says that the thing that we should be most scared about is the state apparatus. He's still reading Orwell. He's still thinking of the world in terms of 1984, in terms of Big Brother. For a movie about that, go and see the East German film, The Lives of Others. Someone brought up the Stasi. That was the old world in which the, the, authority, the, the totalitarian state, this holder of a single truth, watched over its citizens and purged its citizens. But the 21st century is very different. I don't think that the state is very powerful anymore. I think the state is in crisis in every sense, in terms of its ideological legitimacy, in terms of its financial might, in terms of its very viability. It's fragmenting, it's in crisis, it's being challenged on every front. And I think the gentleman at the back who said, well, he's scared of the state. Yeah, in a way, you should be scared of the state. I'm not saying it's going away. But I think that there are other organizations now that we should be much more fearful of. Apple, for example, I don't know what its market cap is, but it literally could buy all of Europe. Private insurance companies, Google, these are companies with much more power and much more data than the government. So I think this idea that we should be fearful of the government is wrong. Big Brother has been fragmented into many little brothers. We're living in a world of little brothers. Maybe we should be fearful of ourselves, too. For another movie reference, go and see this new uh, Ridley Scott movie, Prometheus. We, and Prometheus is a company which is much more powerful than any government. And I, I, that's what I most fear. I think Norman's right to say we shouldn't be too fearful. My brand is built on making people scared. So if we are to be fearful, uh, it's of new organizations, tech companies, tech companies that aren't even tech companies in the future. Google's developing a, a self-driving car. Google are developing data glasses, which means when we wear them, when we look at each other, we'll see data. When we're in Google's self-driving cars, they'll know where we are all the time. I'm much more fearful of that than the state. The British state couldn't develop a self-driving car or glasses if it had two centuries to do so. So real innovation and genius and danger, I think, is with corporations rather than governments in the 21st century. I have